it's Berlin for the entire tour. <laughs> That's not exactly the case. We have now crossed out of the Berlin borough of Mitte. We're now in the Berlin borough of Kreuzberg. Kreuzberg became part of the American sector just after the Second World War that then became part of Democratic West Berlin after the country was divided back into two separate states back in 1949. So we've now crossed out of the east and into the west and a very good example or at least indication that we have that we have crossed out of the east and into the west is what you see right here an actual piece of the Berlin Wall. A piece of the Berlin Wall. Yep this is what I'm talking about folks. <laughs> An actual, okay. An actual piece here of the Berlin Wall um, uh, still standing here in this part of town. Now, construction on the Berlin Wall began back in August of 1961. But the wall that you're looking at here, though, folks, is not from 1961. This wall here is from the 1970s. You see, the East German government was always trying to find ways Ways to improve not only the security around the wall but also the wall itself and so what they ended up doing then in the 1970s was replacing the original wall which basically consisted of concrete blocks that stand that were stacked on top of each other with a barbed wire fence that used to run at the top <coughs> with a sort of precast concrete and a concrete top that you see today now the idea behind the concrete top according to the East German government was that it would prevent people from pulling themselves over the wall but that's assuming that anybody would have been able to get up that close to the wall on the other side because remember that area just before the wall on the east side was that death strip, that no man's land that was heavily patrolled by East German guards. So getting up that close would have been almost impossible. Um, there were escapes that took place uh, back uh, after the wall was built. Um, tonight on that I Spy tour, you'll learn of one of those uh, escapes that um, was conducted through means of a tunnel. Several tunnel escapes would have taken place, maybe in some cases where one person jumped from one building to another building. Many ingenious ways that people were able to escape. The only problem though today is that we don't exactly know as to how many escapes were successful because anybody who escaped from the east over here to the west always made sure to keep it very quiet because back in the east the east german government was controlled by a secret state police known as the stasi and the chief aim of the stasi was to know everything about everyone using any means it chose it knew who your friends were and knew whom you telephoned it was the internal army by which the east german government kept control Overt or covert, there was always somebody reporting to the Stasi in every apartment block, every building, every pub. So that meant if you were an East German who escaped over here uh, to the west by maybe through means of a tunnel or maybe jumped from one building to another building, if you found some sort of a loophole and then you decided to announce it, and especially if the West German media had made you out to be some sort of heroes, anybody who you were close to back in the east would have been subject to victimization by the East German government. So maybe if you still had a sister or a brother who were back in the East and they were studying at university, they would have been yanked right out of university straight away. Um, uh, very lethal obstacles that they would have had to cross over, of course, as we said before, you'll see it and get an example of that later on tonight. Um, one of the main reasons as to why that the wall still stands today is because back in the 1980s, while the Berlin Wall was still standing, the West Berlin government here on this side of the wall funded the very first memorial dedicated to those people who lost their lives to the Nazis with an outdoor memorial called the Topography of Terror. And the Topography of Terror goes over into very specific detail about the two terror networks of the Nazis, those being the SS and the Gestapo. Right over here where you see this gray building standing today in front of the museum that you see in the distance used to stand an old university building that looked just like this. An industrial arts building that belonged to the university here in Berlin. And from 1933 onward, just after the Nazis came to power and after that dictatorship was installed under Hitler, the Nazis set up their own police forces. Police forces that were, from that point onward, trained and were ordered to arrest anybody who was publicly or politically outspoken against the Nazis. If you said anything in opposition about the Third Reich from this point onward, you would have been arrested, you were brought here to this location, you were put in a torture cell where you were tortured for information to see if you had any neighbors or any family members or any friends who were thinking along the same lines that you were before then sending you off to a concentration camp. And a lot of those early opponents of the Nazis uh, 
the main uh, concentration camp here in this part of the country that many of them were sent to was the Sachsenhausen concentration camp located just 35 kilometers north here of Berlin. This was a major concentration camp in existence between 1936 and 1945. And during those years, around 200,000 different people made their way through Sachsenhausen and respectively around 50,000 of them perished. Certainly also it was the place where the official headquarters of the entire concentration camp system um, uh, operated from, the main administration. So really a very important um, concentration camp to the Nazis and persecuting their so-called undesirables. Did you make your way to a concentration camp on this trip? Yeah, yeah which one? In Mauthausen. Okay. <laughs> Next door then. Um, the Gestapo headquarters used to stand an old hotel that used to be situated right here where we're standing, an old hotel called the Prince Albrecht Hotel. Now all we have left of this hotel, as well as the university building that became Gestapo headquarters, are just the ruins and the foundations that you see right down here behind me. But in 1934, this hotel became the official headquarters of the SS, the elite paramilitary of Nazi <laughs> Germany. Now the SS in German stands for Schustoffel, which means protection squad. And that's exactly what it was when it was set up back in 1925. It was an elite bodyguard unit that was formed to protect Hitler. But in 1929, the SS was handed over to the most feared man of the Third Reich, this man right here, a man by the name of Heinrich Himmler. And from 1929 onward, it was now Heinrich Himmler's responsibility to turn the SS into one very large bureaucracy of terror. And out of all the responsibilities that the SS would have throughout German society, Folks, what's important to keep in mind about these guys is that they are the ones who became the architects of those concentration camps. These are the guys who are the guards in the camps. These are the guys who administered the camps. And these are the guys that would carry out millions of atrocities against so many Europeans all the way up to the end of the Second World War. It was those top SS officers, including Heinrich Himmler himself, who had their offices right here on these grounds where you're standing today. They came up with some of the planned persecution some of the planned deportations, and even some of the planned executions, which were not only carried out here in concentration camps here in Germany, but as you saw down in Austria and other parts of Europe, specifically after the onset of the Second World War. Folks, when we talk about total control over the populations of Europe, it was these two terror networks that succeeded on many levels and unfortunately doing just that. Today, um, the official um, topography of terror, which has gone through several transformations throughout the years, um, much of the information used to be down here in the ruins, but it has now been moved inside that gray building. And inside that gray building, the memorial of attempts to give you a thorough overview of the SS and Gestapo between 1933 and 1945. Um, a lot of documents, a lot of photos on display that really support and complement that information, all of which has been translated into English. Folks, this museum over here is open seven days a week. It's open till 8 p.m., which is two hours past when most museums here in Berlin close. And finally, it's free of charge. And all of those, all of those features here to this memorial and this museum is another wonderful way in showing you how this city today continues to be very serious about confronting this history and educating anybody who is willing to come and learn more about it. Right over here at this intersection is where Checkpoint Charlie is, and I'll talk about that from right here where we've got a little bit more space and where it's a bit quieter. I want to point out, though, you can see right down here, and you may have seen this already as we were walking up the street, there's a cobblestone brick path right out here next to this curb. And that cobblestone brick path marks where the wall used to stand between 1961 and 1989. This is not the original foundation of the wall by any means. It was put in as a marker back in the 1990s. Not only does it mark where the wall used to stand, but it also marks the boundary between the Berlin borough of Kreuzberg and the Berlin borough of Mitte, where I am, that then of course became the um, occupied Soviet sector and in the American sector here in this part of town between 1949 all the way up until 1990. Um, the, um, so if you're walking around town, you look down at your feet and you see this cobblestone path that has no earthly business being there, chances are that's where the wall used to, used to stand. Now, Checkpoint Charlie over here answers the question, if the West Berliners have this gigantic wall built around them, how did they get out? Well, if I show you a picture here of Berlin, divided, you can see here's the city of Berlin. Now in white is West Berlin, 
And obviously the other part in beige and in the surrounding is East Berlin and communist East Germany all around the city. Now here in the city center, there were a total of eight border crossings that existed down to the center of the city, which would have allowed West Berliners to go over to here to the east to visit friends and family. If you were a West Berliner who wanted to go over to West Germany, obviously you'd have to cross over East German territory. So you would have gone to one of two checkpoints right here. You would have gone through passport control. You were put then on a transit highway and you had to drive straight across East Germany to go over to the west. And that's where you would have gone through passport control 120 miles to the west of here. So in other words, division, um, during the division, the transport and the opportunity to move between West Berlin and West Germany was possible, but an East Berliner and East Germany getting into that island of democracy after 1961 was a diff different story. What makes Checkpoint Charlie so significant and why it's such a historical border crossing today is because out of the eight border crossings that existed down through the center of the city, Checkpoint Charlie was the one checkpoint here in the city that was allied control. That is controlled by the four victorious allies of the Second World War, Great Britain, France, the United States, and the Soviet Union. So it was a checkpoint that was obviously used by military personnel and was also used by foreigners. So if you had all been here 24 years ago on this day, back in January of 1989, and you were vacationing down here in West Berlin, you got permission to go over to the east to do some sightseeing, you would have crossed at Checkpoint Charlie uh, more than likely because you were a foreigner. So I guess you could say that this was the world's crossing point between 1961 and 1989. And because it was also located right here at the south of the Friedrichstrasse, the main street that runs north through, north south to the heart of Berlin, it really stood as a symbol of division between the two cities, particularly during the 28 years that the Berlin Wall stood. It's a replica of its original. That is to say the U.S. Army checkpoint box you see out in the middle of the street. That's just a replica from the one that uh, used to stand here. Uh, back in the 1960s. Um, you can see the very familiar, you are entering the American sector sign. That too is just a replica. And this bizarre photo up here of uh, Sergeant Harper is actually the idea of a Berlin artist in his way of remembering this area as being Checkpoint Charlie. If you make your way to the other side, you'll find a picture of a Russian soldier, which marks uh, that this was the ally control checkpoint here on the eight border crossings in the city. Um, so this right here would have been the spot where the British, the Americans, and the French would have controlled the checkpoint. We're now in the corridor here. If you've gone up the street um, about 20, 30 meters, you'd have gone to the checkpoint then that was controlled by the Soviets and the East Germans. So we're right now, right in the middle of those two checkpoints. I'd say that the main sort of attention uh, that uh, really Checkpoint Charlie gets a lot today, or at least the main attraction, if you want to call it that, is what's behind the windows here at the Checkpoint Charlie Museum. And the Checkpoint Charlie Museum has all these different ways that we, people are able to escape. Uh, talked about um, uh, escape stories on how people tunneled underneath the wall. Maybe they were hidden in one of the uh, a car and driven through one of the checkpoints. All these ingenious ways that are known, uh, many of them are on display here in Checkpoint Charlie Museum. So I guess you can make your way in there if you are interested in, in learning more about that.